we just had the opportunity to return uh, visiting some of the financial markets in New York, Toronto, Montreal, and Chicago, and we had a very, uh, a very good reception, and uh, it was a very, very valuable tour. And so I'm sharing with you the the same presentation that uh, that we provided on that tour. But the one thing that uh, I know for sure as a as a proud British Columbian is that uh, I think the world changed immeasurably for governments in 2008. Uh, with the uh, collapse of Lehman Brothers, uh, the subprime mortgage meltdown, and all the you know other concurrent problems around the world, um, I think we're in a very different world, and governments had better adjust to that reality very, very quick. And the governments that do that, I think, are going to prosper into the future. The governments that retain the confidence of the investment community, of their own taxpayers, and of the financial markets, are, are going to be in a very positive cycle, kind of a virtuous cycle that will play on itself, feed on itself, and, and create a very, very bright future. For governments that don't do that and try to ignore the fact that they've built up too much debt and that their deficits are too large and they're not taking that seriously and they're not generating confidence by demonstrating that they can manage that, uh, are going to be in a whole world of trouble. And we've seen evidence of that around the world. You people know better than anyone else, but I can tell you as a British Columbian and a Canadian, I have never been so proud to travel around the world and to be able to talk about our province and our country uh, knowing how strong we are in relation to so many other jurisdictions. And I think that that strength is going to be something that will continue to grow and serve us well. So you can see here, of course, um, one of the reasons we have this slide starting off the show is because we like to talk about a strategy we've had in place for British Columbia now for uh, about seven years called the Asia Pacific Gateway Strategy and it's a, a federal, provincial, private sector initiative to say let's work together, identify the joint investments we can make to open up British Columbia to the fastest growing part of the world which is the Asia Pacific. And the uh, opening of the or the containerization of the Port of Prince Rupert has been an enormous success. This is one of the rare times in government where we took a chance we often don't make because typically uh, my experience has been that if the private sector is unwilling to make an investment it's probably not a good idea for government to move in and make that investment but in this case we both the province and the federal government really believed that there was a big opportunity in containerizing the port of prince rupert a deep water port that was two and a half days sailing time closer to asia and we went ahead and did that in partnership with the private sector port and that has been an enormous success that has opened up and expanded the supply chain options for a lot of the buyers in the U.S. Midwest that are bringing in goods from Asia and vice versa. It's opened up export opportunities for British Columbia. And I'll talk about that a bit more in the future, but we start out on this slide so that the people in the United States understand that our geographic location is the only Pacific province in the country gives us a real advantage. And it is uh, really being strengthened by the Prime Minister today uh, who is trying to open up new free trade agreements and make sure that Canada is part of new free trade agreements uh, with many of the fastest growing Asian countries in the world. So that's something we're very encouraged by. But the reason why I would argue British Columbia enjoys a AAA credit rating is because of this chart. This chart shows uh, how we have performed over the last 11 years both uh, in our budget targets and where we ended up. So the dark blue uh, band that you see there is the budget target that was set out at the budget at the beginning of the year and the light blue is where we ended up at the end of the year at what's called public accounts in July when we report out all the finalized numbers. And you can see in 2001 when, when we first got elected we inherited a, a deficit, a structural deficit in fact, um, by the, uh, the, the prior NDP government that had been in power for 10 years. And the following year, you see it actually got deeper. The reason it got deeper is you may recall in our first day in office, we cut personal income taxes 25% across the board because we were trying to send a signal to you folks and to the public in British Columbia that we were gonna be dramatically uh, moving in a different direction. We wanted to leave more money in the pockets of British Columbians and we felt that by doing so, we would uh, encourage investment and, and encourage confidence. And every single year there, you can see we outperformed. In the good years, where we ran those significant surpluses, we used those surpluses to pay down debt and to continue to lower taxes, both business uh, and personal income taxes. And then you can see in 0809 where the, the beginnings of uh, the market challenges started to hit North America and around the world. And in 2009 was the one year we got it wrong. In 2009, the uh, deficit 
target was 495 million, but the speed and the scale and the scope of the downturn was such that uh, it, it, it went well past that. And we were off by about 1.2 billion. Now, no government, especially ours, especially under our former premier, who was very, uh, felt very, very strongly about uh, fiscal discipline, as does our current premier, as do, as do we still. But, you know, uh, going and having that kind of situation was not a great thing. But the, the rating agencies essentially said to us, look, you get a pass for that year because virtually everyone missed their targets in 2009. So the, the key to us is how you're going to be performing and getting back to balanced budget. Well, you can see the following year we outperformed in the other direction. Uh, by 1.4 billion, we almost balanced the budget, and we've got a very credible path to get back to balanced bu budget in 2013. The same is uh, true with our debt to GDP ratio. We have always typically outperformed our budget targets. So when you look into our budget, you see what our projected or the actual debt to GDPs are. We typically will come in below that, and that will continue in the future. And I'll talk about debt to GDP a little bit more in a future slide. Um, we believe the AAA credit rating is important. There is going to be a further wave of credit downgrades around the world uh, over the next 12 months, I believe. And uh, that is going to mean that Canada and British Columbia, as, as a sub-sovereign, and, and, uh, is going to join the ranks of a rapidly diminishing club. But we think it's a very important club because we think that uh, having that AAA credit rating and demonstrating that you can operate in a low tax, low debt environment that encourages investment and growth and opportunity is possible in the world that we're in today. And so uh, that's something that British Columbia intends to hang on to. And uh, I'll talk about that in a moment too. So just to uh, give you an idea on our budget. So we have always, when we're building our budget, tried to be very conservative in our growth projections. And I think this is very important because uh, what we don't want to see in a budget is optimistic uh, outlooks that try to make the budget look better uh, than it may actually be given the uncertain world economy. So in 2012, you can see the light green is what we call the Independent Forecast Council. So it's made up of 14 economists from uh, many of your institutions, but also some other independent forecast economists that come together every year, meet with uh, the finance minister and sit down and provide us with a very detailed outlook of what they see for real GDP growth in British Columbia. We then take the consensus average out of those 14 and we discount further from that. And that's the number that goes into our budget. And the reason we do that is because if there's going to be any surprises, we want those surprises to be on the upside, not the downside. And it's important for you to know that because you can see that in 2012, 2013, 2014, that the Independent Forecast Council, your experts, your economists, believe that we're going to do better than what British Columbia believes. Uh, now, if they are correct, then there's the potential for up to half a billion dollars in additional revenues to the province, uh, if the light green bars happen to be the ones that are right. But we, we do believe it's important for us to be conservative. And, and I just want to talk about 2011 for just a moment. Because at the beginning of the year, that light green bar was at 2.8%. So the, at the beginning of the year, the Forecast Council average was more optimistic. We set ours at 2% because we were worried about, at that time, the U.S. debt negotiations were still underway. There was rumblings uh, in Europe, and we just felt that it was not the time to be even remotely optimistic, to be honest with you. So we, we set ours at 2% GDP growth. And I got criticized last July. The NDP and some of the even some of the media were saying, "Oh, you guys are lowballing it." And I gave the reason why we came in at two. We were, we were being cautious, admittedly, but we felt it was important to be cautious given the climate we're in. Well, of course, you can see what happened. The private sector forecaster numbers came down to 2.2, and frankly, 2% uh, was the right right number for us to pick. So that that's important for all your investors to know because British Columbia budgets conservatively, and we'll continue to do so. I'm going to blaze through some of these slides just to know the retail sales have bounced back. In fact, they're above the, the peak that we saw in 2007. Uh, and we expect them to remain steady going forward. They're not going to light the world on fire, but we think we'll have uh, a slow but steady retail sales activity. Our employment, our, our employed uh, in British Columbia is at the highest level it's ever been at. Uh, and right now our unemployment rate is about 7%. It's below the national average, which is about 7.2 and we have some cautious optimism in terms of employment growth going forward. We think that uh, there's a lot of very good things happening in British Columbia. We've seen some uh, very significant investments. Rio Tinto El Can, of course, uh, over a $3 billion investment 
uh, in the uh, Kim Kitimat smelter, uh, the Kamano project uh, in the northwest of the province of British Columbia. Uh, those kind of investments, the shipbuilding contract, the private sector investments we're seeing in the mining sector, uh, and of course uh, even digital media technology, etc. So we're seeing some broad-based activity that gives us encouragement on the employment side. Housing starts are going to be steady. We don't think that they're going to be uh, what they were back in 07 or 08, uh, but we think that the housing starts are going to be pretty steady. Uh, we're liking some of the recent numbers that we're seeing because we think they're healthy, and uh, but not uh, overly healthy, if you will. So uh, I, I see good stability in the housing side. We can talk about that during Q&A if you wish. Um, but at the beginning when I talked about the Asia Pacific, look what it's done to British Columbia's trade profile. I mean, we didn't look much different than Alberta and Ontario back when I first got elected in 2001. Uh, but you can see now that British Columbia exports less than 43% of our exports to the United States, about 40% to Asia and the rest, uh, to the rest of the world. We are a very diversified economy and I think that that's important because uh, that diversification acts as a bit of a shock absorber and we are also seeing real growth to the fastest growing part of the world which is Asia and that I think is a good thing for British Columbia and for Canada so that uh, we believe will continue going forward. Uh, you can see the US consensus outlook for real GDP growth has been varying. This is the monthly um, forecast consensus outlook in the United States. It started to drop pretty dramatically uh, starting in June. I can tell you as we started putting together the budget I was very, very nervous about the United States and in fact um, I said in November that I was not going to be committing to a balanced budget in 2013 until I saw the year-end numbers coming out of the United States uh, in December and, and I wasn't going to make a decision until late January and I'm glad I did that because we started to see a flattening in, in uh, October and then we start in November, December and then we started to see the numbers edge up a little bit and that was the first time I had a sense that the, the floor wasn't going to keep, keep falling uh, underneath us and, and so going forward the latest consensus average now is 2.3 percent. You should know that for the purposes of our budget, our budget model, we have used 1.4 percent real GDP growth in the United States in 2012. So again, British Columbia is very, very cautious and obviously uh, it looks like it's not going to end up at 1.4 thankfully. Um, the Eurozone, we all know what's happening there, so I won't say much except that the consensus average for, is for negative growth. And we watch the Eurozone uh, fairly closely, not because we have much of a trade relationship, we're not very trade exposed there, but we are, are seeing pretty significant growth in export activity to China, and the Eurozone is China's uh, number one export market. So that's why we, we keep an eye on what's happening uh, in the Eurozone, and uh, hopefully we'll see some better things there. So what's our fiscal outlook? Well, we're balancing the budget. In 13-14, I feel very confident that I can say to all of you, we will balance the budget. And I, uh, in fact, I, I am hopeful that we will do what we always do and outperform. We've got very strict expenditure control and discipline on the spending side. I'll talk about that in a future slide. Uh, we're protecting essential services. And this is important because in many states in the United States, they're having, unfortunately, to cut back on investments that are important, like in healthcare or education or post-secondary. In British Columbia, we have not only been able to provide record levels of investment, both operating and capital, in our health sector, our post-secondary sector, our K-12 sector, uh, but even going forward, although the amount of increases are going to be moderated dramatically, uh, they're coming off some pretty significant growth levels and that is important that we are able to as an economy make those important investments. Um, and we're going to continue to have a robust capital program and we will have uh, be able to do that in a very sustainable manner. So how are we managing expenditures? This graph actually gives you a, a pretty good idea of what's happening. Up until 0809, we were averaging annual spending growth of almost 6%. Once we got hit with the downturn, we realized that we're in a whole different world and, and at least this government was going to get used to the fact that we're probably in a low growth environment in North America for at least a decade. And given that, we better get our spending profile to more properly reflect what the growth rates are going to be. And so we cut our spending growth in half to about 3% uh, over the last three years. We didn't just say we were going to do it, we actually did it. And that's important to understand because a lot of governments will make the promise but then uh, don't actually get there. And going forward you can see that we're going to keep our spending overall growth to about 2% a year. And 
Uh, virtually all of those dollars are going into healthcare, K to 12 education, and post secondary. Every other ministry is is pretty much frozen or is going to be reduced uh, in spending. Uh, so you can see how we do that in the big three ministries. Uh, healthcare. I'm a former health minister, so I actually had the uh, the luck of getting uh, becoming a health minister right when the economy started to plummet across the, around the world. Uh, but you can see we took our healthcare spending growth from 7% to 4.8%. Over the next three years, it'll be 3.2%. But here's the thing. What we didn't do is do what Canadians always do, or Canadian governments always do in healthcare. They just basically restrict the spending and create huge waiting lists and, and starve the system and create problems. What we did is we said, no, we're going to fundamentally change how we deliver healthcare in British Columbia. And it's not easy to do, by the way, but it's important to do. Because again, in healthcare expenditures, uh, we have to recognize with an aging demographic uh, and the fact that there is not going to be unlimited dollars that you're going to be able to put into healthcare, we're going to have to find better ways as Canadians to uh, deliver our healthcare system in a sustainable way. So we can talk about that in the Q&A if you want, but we, just as a couple of examples, we did, uh, we set up, a, uh, we collapsed all the different supply chains and the different health authorities into a single purchasing organization. Uh, that alone has, has generated savings uh, that will hit about a quarter of a billion dollars uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, we've delivered uh, services differently. We're having patients. Uh, what we call patient-focused funding, where dollars follow the patients to try and drive productivity and efficiency uh, in healthcare delivery. We've had remarkable results uh, in that in British Columbia, and there's a whole bunch of other things that we're doing to try and bend down the cost curve uh, in healthcare, but do it at the same time as driving better outcomes in the system, and it is possible. Uh, debt to GDP, you can see we got as low as 13.3% before we got hit with the downturn. We will peak at 18.3% and then our debt to GDP will start trending down again. Uh, but remember, we typically outperform those numbers. So for example, you can see in 11-12, uh, we've got 16.4%. Uh, in the budget, it was 17.5%. So we, we feel pretty confident that... Uh, that will continue to um, be very disciplined on the debt to GDP. And of course, this is in a world, of course, where you've got Canada at about 36, uh, Quebec is about 50, Ontario is on its way to 50 and who knows where. Uh, and of course, you have you know what's going on. The United States is about, I think, about 73% if you don't include, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Uh, France is over 80 and, you know, Greece, forget it. It's way, way up there. I won't do depress anybody. Um, we're competitive with the corporate uh, tax rate side. Just to quickly point out, BC share of the general corporate tax rate, so this is for the larger businesses doing over half a million in, business, in uh, revenues. Um, we've reduced from 16.5% to 10%, so combined with the federal 15% rate, we're at 25 So that's a good story, we, we believe. I think we're very tax competitive on the small business side. We've raised the threshold for what we define as a small business from two hundred dollars to $500,000 a year, and we've dropped the rate to, from 45 to 2.5% for small business. Um, and uh, we, we think we're, we've got a good story to tell there. We're, you can see what's happened on personal income tax side. Again, 37% reduction across the board since 2001. Uh, British Columbians pay the lowest personal income tax rates in the country. If you earn up to 119,000 a year, over 119,000 were second lowest behind Alberta. So we think we've got a good story to tell there too. And for all the people that, like the left wingers that tell you that by cutting taxes you starve yourself of revenue, we're collecting more personal income tax revenue today than we were in 2001. And, and back in the 90s when uh, the NDP had us at 54.3% top marginal tax rate, the highest in North America. So it is a myth to believe that you can't reduce rates and grow the economy and generate additional revenues. We all know that, but I just like to say it anyhow. Um, our competitiveness, we got a jobs plan, so we're going to focus on creating uh, high paying jobs, expanded small business venture capital. Uh, when we say we're promoting our competitive advantage, what we mean by that is we put aside dollars in the budget, $15 million, to go into key markets to get in front of key decision makers, find out what they read, what they look at, and get the BC story in front of them. Basically, some of the key elements that I'm explaining to you today, we want to get into some uh, key capital markets because we think 
that there's a lot of scared money in the world today and we want to make sure we bring it home to British Columbia, Canada because there's a lot of investment looking for a safe harbour and we're going to make sure they know about British Columbia when they're thinking about what to do. We eliminated the provincial jet fuel tax on international flights because we want to encourage more tourism and we also had an agreement with YVR that they uh, had signed agreements from a number of airlines making a commitment to add additional flights if BC took that step. So that's something we're, we think is a, a good business case. And on our port tax, uh, municipal port tax rates we've capped in British Columbia per, in perpetuity. And that's because we wanted to make sure that we were encouraging additional investments in port infrastructure. It has been a huge success since we put that in place in 2007. And there's been well over a billion and a half dollars of new private sector investments in the ports, which is again helping to open up the gateway opportunity. And it's something we want to see continue. And so we're, we've made that permanent and we make up the difference uh, to the municipalities so they're held whole. Um, finally, or not finally, but we've got a, a robust capital program. It's not as big as it was during the downturn, but it's still very significant at almost record levels. And over the next three years, there's $19.2 billion of capital investment in British Columbia. Uh, $10.7 billion of that is what we call taxpayer-supported debt. Uh, the other $8.5 billion is what's called self-supported. So that would be like the, uh, the Portman Bridge project, uh, which is supported by toll revenues, or the BC Hydro, which is it, it, probably 85% of the self-supported debt. So a very significant uh, capital program that will be investing in strategic investments in transportation and healthcare facilities, new hospitals, in new investments in post-secondary and new schools, uh, literally dozens of new schools throughout the province in the K-12 sector. Uh, we're still a leader in the country in private-public partnerships. Uh, we've done 35 plus partnership projects representing over 12 billion dollars of capital. Five billion of that is private sector investment. And what's important, I used to really emphasize this on our, our tour that we did, uh, particularly in the U.S., there's a lot of uh, people that believe that we do private-public partnerships to keep debt off book. You should know that it's all on book in British Columbia, and I say all of it. We have a very conservative Auditor General who insists that the entire amount, including the private sector equity, is all shown on book. So um, we do it because we have found through every single P3 project we've engaged in that all of them have been delivered on or ahead of schedule or on or under budget. And this is something that uh, is very, very good for the province and we will continue. We've got new projects coming through the pipeline on a regular basis. There will be new hospitals being announced. There will be new major transportation projects and something that I think will be uh, certainly welcomed in the investment world. Our budget also has uh, uh, several levels of prudence. Uh, between our contingencies and our forecast allowances, we've got $1.6 billion of cushion to ensure that we meet our budget targets. Uh, so again, that's something that we want to make sure we do. And of course, our conservative economic assumptions provide the potential for up to half a billion dollars in additional revenue. So uh, between all three of those, well over $2 billion of cushion to ensure that we meet or beat our targets. So we're uh, looking ahead, we're diversified, we're competitive tax-wise, we got a sound uh, fiscal management record, uh, we got huge activity happening in the mining sector, a lot of natural resources in British Columbia, the gateway and, and making sure we have a sustainable health system. We added this slide because last time uh, I was in New York, we had a lot of questions about pension funds. And in the United States, this is a very ugly story, as you know. They've got lots of unfunded pension liabilities that are literally uh, bankrupting cities, municipalities, states uh, are at risk, etc. So uh, we like to talk about our, our pension uh, story. Um, we have fully funded public sector pensions in British Columbia. Uh, they're operated and designed in, on what we call a joint trusteeship basis, where there's an employer representative, employee representative that have fiduciary obligations to ensure that every three years when there is an actuarial undertaking that's, that's done, if there's any shortfalls identified, they have to either add additional contributions by employer employees or scale back the level of benefits that are being offered. And I can tell you that is a very um, positive story when we were telling that. In Illinois, for example, they have an $83 billion unfunded pension liability and a pretty optimistic discount rate of 8.5% returns that they're expecting. And not too many people believe that that's likely. So you can just imagine uh, some of these jurisdictions. And I, I, I can't talk about the other provinces. I think 
Some of the other provinces, I believe, have unfunded liabilities too that they're going to have to manage. But I think this is a very, very positive story for British Columbia.